Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Great to be with you this evening. Bill Brannick here, and welcome to our final Connected Educators webinar of the academic year. Tonight we are focusing on digital literacy for the elementary classroom. Tonight, as always, we encourage you to share via social media throughout the presentation and to continue to connect with each other uh, and with AOP Tech using the hashtag AOP Tech on social media. Tonight, we welcome back uh, Alyssa DeVito, who joins us after having her little boy Noah last month. Alyssa, welcome back to the webinars. Thanks, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here, and thanks, everybody, for the, the well wishes. I've, I've been sent for uh, baby Noah and I. We're doing great, so happy to be back. And great to have you back, Alyssa. Thanks for being here. And as always, uh, Aaron Heights, our other tech integration coach, is with us this evening as well. Aaron, how are you doing this evening? I'm doing really well. I had a, an amazing CrossFit workout today, so I am I am pumped and ready for a great webinar. Sounds good. Uh, I, I can hear the uh, the excitement coming through. So excellent. And everybody, Alyssa and Aaron will be assisting us um, in taking your questions in the questions window uh, this evening throughout our webinar. Um, so please don't hesitate to ask any questions that you may have uh, while our presenter is presenting. Uh, as our, always, here is the general template of our uh, agenda. We'll go through a couple of housekeeping um, pieces of information in just a minute. But as we do all good things, if we could gather together in the presence of our Lord and together in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. Loving, gracious God, you have brought us to the light of a new day. Renew in us the spirit of curiosity as we gather for this journey this evening. Thanks to all those in our school community and our families who support us each and every day in this, our vocation of Catholic education. Provide blessings upon our presenter this evening as she brings her knowledge and experiences to assist us in continuing our mission. And we ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As a reminder, um, this webinar is being recorded. The archive will be posted within the next uh, 24 to 48 hours on our YouTube channel at AOP Tech. Um, as a reminder as well, if you did register for Act 48 credit, that credit will, or the, the follow-up evaluation will be sent out um, from Sister William Edward Quinn's office in the Office of Catholic Education. Uh, if you would be able to fill that out, um, to be able to receive your Act 48 credit. This will be separate from the webinar evaluation that we provide uh, both at the end of the webinar this evening and as well in the follow-up email with all of the resources that will be provided um, tomorrow. Throughout our webinar this evening, we will have an opportunity to be able to engage with, uh, with Shannon, our presenter tonight. Um, just as a reminder, you should see if you are on a laptop or a desktop, um, you should see a floating control panel over on your right-hand side of the screen. On that, there's a little menu that pops out on the left-hand side, and if you look towards the bottom of that menu, there is a little hand with an arrow pointing up. Um, that will give you the opportunity to raise your hand if you have a question, uh, or if you, were, if you would like to engage uh, at the appropriate times, raise that hand. I will come over. I will give you uh, the microphone so that you have the opportunity to make a comment or ask a question. Just as a reminder, because the webinar is being archived, um, I will identify you by name. That will also be archived in our recording. Um, if you would prefer to, um, to ask a question privately or anonymously, um, that can be done also, again, on your control panel. Um, looking midway down, uh, you should see a questions window or chat window, and that's where you can send in your question and we will have an opportunity for uh, Alyssa and Aaron to be able to monitor that window and answer any questions that they can or to be able to bring up uh, those questions again anonymously at the appropriate time with our presenter this evening. And speaking of, uh, I am thrilled this evening to be able to introduce uh, Mrs. Shannon Miller as our featured presenter this evening. Um, there are a number of accomplishments there that I, I you know, certainly I'll touch on, um, but the first one that I wanna mention is that Shannon is not only a, a wonderful educator and certainly um, a wonderful voice for education and for the voices of our students um, in the educational community and in our classrooms, um, Shannon is a wonderful personal friend. As uh, Shannon and I did a lot of work together uh, a number of years ago, 
when I was principal over at Bonner and Prendy, um, and by connecting our kids, and Shannon and I co-taught co uh, a class um, on Web 2.0 2 tools and digital literacy at that time. Um, and it is just wonderful to have Shannon with us this evening. And as you can see, currently Shannon um, has a number of different roles. Um, but is the spokesperson both for the Future Ready Libraries and Project Connect. Um, you can find Shannon if you follow her on Twitter, uh, at Shannon M. Miller. Um, see a lot of great posts and engage with her as she does go and speak um, throughout the world um, and also you know, provides tips and resources uh, about Buncee and through Cantata Learning um, and a number of other different resources. Uh, Shannon and I did connect uh, in the time when she was a district teacher librarian uh, in the Van Meter Community School Districts in rural Iowa, just outside of the state capital in Des Moines. And while the uh, awards and honors could not be fully listed here, um, just a couple of the most notable and recent. Um, 2016, Shannon was um, recognized by the International Society for Technology and Education uh, with their Making It Happen Award and in 2014, from the Library Journal, Movers and Shakers, as a educator innovator. Um, and Shannon, um, you can follow Shannon both again on Twitter at Shannon M. Miller, uh, and also read her blog at vanmeterlibraryvoice.blogspot.com. And Shannon, with that, um, uh, again, I'll kick it over to you. And uh, I am thrilled and just grateful for, you know, for all of your time and energy and effort that you've put into, um, you know, to getting this presentation together. So, Shannon, thank you, and the platform is yours. And I can see your screen, so it looks like you're good to go. Well, thank you so much, and it means a lot to me to be here, um, not just with all of you, but especially with my dear friend, Bill. So it's really great to be here tonight, and I get to talk about things that I'm passionate about, so that's always a fun thing, too. Um, I want to just give you a chance to get, if you haven't yet, um, whoops, let's see what happened here. Get back to the screen. There we go. Can you see that again? Yep, you're good. Okay, cool. I just want to give you guys a chance to get to this QR code and um, either the bit.ly, so I see a lot of you already in the presentation, but I'll give you a minute if you haven't because one thing that I always like to do is give everybody the resources that we're going to talk about so you feel comfortable and that you can succeed afterwards too because there is going to be a lot of information tonight um, and so you'll want to make sure that you get this down so you can get to all of the cool resources and things, information that you can use um, as well. But tonight we're going to talk about digital literacy in the elementary classroom. And even though I was a librarian, K-12, in Van Meter, I worked with the elementary teachers and the elementary kids all the time in their classroom, too. And because of collaboration and all the things that we did together, um, that was, you know, one of my classrooms, too, as a librarian. I have an elementary ed degree and an art degree and a master's in library science and so a lot of my passions really spilled out of the library into the classrooms too when it came to all kinds of literacies and so these stories and these resources and things that I tell will be a lot of the collaboration not just within the library but also within the classroom. Um, as Bill said you can find me on Twitter at Shannon and Miller and my email is right here as well and I also blog at the library voice and I'll share this information too at the end and I was the district teacher librarian at Van Meter um, Bill actually has been here which was so much fun um, to have him not just at our school but also where we lived and we had a really good time showing him around and celebrating him being in our community and this is a great little community outside of Des Moines, about 600 kids, K-12, in this one building. Um, and so you think, like, what could a little town in Van Meter, Iowa, be doing? But for the last 10, 11 years, just really great things have been going on within the building at Van Meter. And I was lucky enough to be the district teacher librarian and do a lot of things when it came to not only creating a community within our library, 
but really seeing how education was changing. And when I first got hired, it was just creating that community and things that we all do, sharing books and reading and teaching our kids. But because of technology and the way that things were changing, we saw a lot of things change too within our kids and within our classrooms and our spaces in our community. And something like, you know, adding computers or sharing a new book, this is the day the crayons quit. And because now we're connected and we use all these different literacies, why not Skype in Drew Daywalt the day that his book comes out and have the author actually read to our kids? And these things were possible because of the technology that we had. And so scenes like this were scenes that we saw all the time because we had access and we had the tools and we had teachers that were forward thinking and really opening up how things were changing and how literacies and learning was changing. And so tonight I'm going to just talk about all of this and it's a topic that we hear a lot about. We hear the word digital literacy and we hear the word digital citizenship and information literacy and all these words on this word cloud are things that we hear all the time and I've been researching a lot. I did a webinar last week um, as well for Follett about digital literacy and citizenship and so I've been doing lots and lots of research the last couple of weeks and the articles always start with it's a topic that people shy away from. It's a topic that people sometimes don't want to address because it is so big and people don't know really what to do with it or where to go. And so when we look at this, you think like, oh my gosh, I have to like do all of these things. Think about how our kids feel, how they have to be safe and they have to use technology and they have to evaluate things and create. And it's overwhelming for us but it's the world that our kids live in. And so all of these things are part of what we're doing, not only in the schools, but when they are at home, when they're in the community, when they go out into the workplace, um, when they graduate. And so we need to address all of these things. And when we look at this, the words that float to the top, the big words, are digital literacy, citizenship, and information. And so tonight we're going to talk about literacy first. And just by defining literacy, it means the ability to read and write. Well, we know that that's changed. And one thing that when we look at digital literacy, we can't forget about digital citizenship. And this is one of those terms, too, that is almost floats even higher than digital literacy. And so I want to address this, too, today, because I think that's where some of the confusion is, is what is the difference between digital citizenship and digital literacy. So when we look at digital citizenship and we look at how digital literacy fits into digital citizenship, I think it makes a lot of sense. Because digital citizenship is defined as empowering our students to make safe, smart, and ethical decisions online. This is a term from Common Sense Media. And when you look at all of the Common Sense Media um, information and all the resources that are on their site, and we're going to look at it a lot tonight, you can see that all the things that we talk about within that umbrella of digital citizenship also falls into a lot of the key parts of digital literacy when we start talking about it. Information literacy, creative um, commons and copyright, cyberbullying, relationships and communications, and so these things go hand in hand. Also, when you look at the common sense, just the term for information literacy, this is, means the same thing as digital literacy. And so it might be termed, when I taught, actually, when we developed our curriculum like 10 years ago, we called it information literacy at that time. It wasn't digital literacy. And so at the bottom it says, regardless of the terminology, be it digital literacy or media literacy, having information literacy skills are fundamental to thrive in a digital space. And that falls into just hand in hand again with making sure that our kids are good digital citizens, that they're getting that digital citizenship curriculum. Now Mike Ribble, he's done a lot of work too, and he does, I actually um, love going to his website because there's so much good information, but it's also really easy for us to understand. And he terms it as digital citizenship is a concept which helps teachers, technology leaders, and parents to understand what students 
teachers, students, children, technology users should know to use technology appropriately. And I think that going here and looking at some of the things that he has really also fits it into making sense of what we need to do in our classrooms and what we need to do in our libraries with our kids. And all of these things that Mike has, the nine elements of digital citizenship, again you can see that digital literacy goes hand in hand with this. So digital communication, digital literacy, digital etiquette, and so you're starting to see that they're really not that different. And so when you hear people talking about these things, you can feel confident that they're not that different and that you know what both of them mean. And really they mean a lot of the same things. When we also look at his, we can see with a little yellow space, the digital literacy one. And so he has a part in there on this website that is just about digital literacy. And so I um, really hope that you go here and you read about the things that Mike has put on his website because it does make sense and it talks about how just digital citizenship involves educating people differently and all of these information literacy skills are part of that and so those go hand in hand. Now that we kind of have digital citizenship defined and we have seen kind of the differences and the similarities, let's take a closer look at defining digital literacy. So I want to know how you would define digital literacy. I'm going to put you guys to work now and see what you think digital literacy means. Now there's no right or wrong answer. We've already talked about digital citizenship. I've given you some clues on maybe what digital literacy means. And so I want you to go to this Padlet and you just can either scan it if you have a device and you don't want to get out of your slides or go to that link at the bottom and I want you to add to this Padlet. Now if you've never been on Padlet before, all you have to do is go to this link and then click on the wall or click on the pink circle in the lower right hand corner to add your definition of digital literacy. You don't have to put your name if you want. Um, you can just put your definition of what you think digital literacy is. Now as we're adding to this, I'm actually going to go out of the presentation for a minute and we're going to look at what everybody is adding to our great Padlet so we can just see this collaboration. I really like to show this too because this is a great tool to use with your kids and this is teaching digital literacy skills. And so think of all the different ways that you would be able to just practice all these digital literacy skills with your kids using a tool like this. Now, I don't see anybody on here yet. Well, there's one person. So as you can see, people are going to start adding their comments to this Padlet. And remember I said that you don't have to add your name. Nobody's going to know who you are and no answer is wrong. You guys can put anything you want just to kind of get out there what we're thinking digital literacy. And this was hard for me when I, like I said, when I have been researching the last couple weeks, um, I of course know what digital literacy means. I think that I really had a firm grasp on it. The more that I read, the more I learned and the more like overwhelmed I felt. But then I realized, and you'll learn too in the next hour and a half, that it's things that we all realize that we're doing, things that we know our kids are doing, and so it's just really great to, you know, see how um, things, you know, how people define it differently, how they look at it regardless of maybe what you're teaching, but I look at it different from as a librarian maybe than like a first grade teacher would, or a fifth grade teacher would, or a parent would, and so I love all of these. Um, and the cool thing about Padlet is if you've never used it before, this is real time, as you can tell. And so if you use this with your students, you can see, and you're in the Padlet too, just how you know, great it is to be able to not only see everybody's response, but to see that collaboration going on too. So a couple things that people are saying, if I can kind of read them for a second. Um, I see incorporating technology and sharing and reading and creating, um, creating and collaborating digitally, knowledge and skills, um, 
the ability to use information and communication. So all kinds of great things being um, added to this Padlet. And we'll go back to this too in just a little bit. So I'm going to go back to the presentation. And you guys just keep adding as I'm talking. So last week I asked also on Twitter um, what people thought digital literacy was, how they defined it. And you'll have to go to this slide because it was really interesting just getting lots of responses. Um, a lot of things that you were putting on the Padlet, being independent, um, determining true from false, a willingness to try to technology. And then I had this great response from a teacher that she really thought about it and was so honest about what she was thinking. And it was great because she said, when we write with a pencil and paper, we don't say we're lead literate. We refer, refer instead to the message on the paper and our language literacy. And I was like, that is so true. Like, we're just now putting it into digital terms. And so I thought her reflection was really interesting um, because even though it has changed into digital, it's still literacy. That's still the grounding part of the term digital literacy. So ALA, a few years ago, they brought together a task force, and it was the Digital Literacy Task Force, and they defined digital literacy as the ability to use information and communication technologies to find, evaluate, create, and communicate information requiring both cognitive and technical skills. In this task force, they also defined what a digitally literate person possesses. And so a variety of skills, if it's technical, if it's cognitive, um, being able to use diverse technologies appropriately and effectively um, to retrieve information, interpret results, and judge the quality of that information, um, understand the relationship between technology and lifelong learning, personal privacy, and stewardship of information, uses the skills for appropriate technology to communicate and collaborate with peers, colleagues, family, and on occasion the general public, and lastly use these skills to actively participate in civil society and contribute to a vibrant, informed, and engaged community. Also when we look at not just the skills that our kids have, I thought this was so interesting and I learned about this at a conference recently, but you think about all the things that our kids need to learn, like when they hit school, even before that when they're in preschool and when they're at home when they're little, these skills are skills that our kids are going to need the rest of their lives. And so when we look at what our libraries and our different institutions are teaching our adults, they're all things that are kids that we have to teach them now when they're young so they have these skills. And when you go to the public library associations, and I love to visit the public libraries um, when I travel, these are the things that they're teaching adults. And sometimes they might be 70, 80 year old people, but they're skills that our kids now are lucky enough to be learning when they're little. Things like using the computer, um, being able to buy a plane ticket electronically, logging into Skype, um, an intro to Facebook, internet privacy, all things that not just when our kids are little, but as we go through life and in jobs and, and just living with our families, these are all skills that we need to also make sure that our kids know. Now, one of my favorite definitions of digital literacy, and this is more of a way of thinking of digital literacy, not just a definition. And Hillary Spires, who's a professor at North Carolina State University, defines it as putting it into three buckets. And so I want you to keep this in your mind, and I want you to go back, too, and read this great Ed Week article um, afterwards, too, because she defines these three buckets as, number one, finding and consuming digital content, number two, creating digital content, and number three, communicating or sharing it. And in this article, just to read you, like, the start of it, um, she says, why the word literacy alone generally refers to reading and writing skills. When you tack on the word digital before it, the term encompasses much, much more. Sure, reading and writing are still very much at the heart of digital literacy, but given the new and ever-changing ways we use technology to receive and communicate information, digital literacy also encompasses a broader range of skills. Everything from reading on a Kindle to gauging the validity of a website 
are creating and sharing YouTube videos. This term is so broad that some experts even stay away from it, preferring to speak more specifically about particular skills at the intersection of technology and literacy. And so by putting it in these three buckets, I love this because it makes sense to us. It makes sense to me. And it's not just this foreign definition. Whenever you're doing something in your classroom, you can think of all these things. Are, is this activity or project hitting these three buckets? How is it fitting into these? So here's an idea. Um, I think that one of the biggest things for me when we made a difference at our school was creating things with our kids, like opening up the conversation to them too. And so we have all these things. You've now heard like four different definitions and four different ideas on digital literacy and citizenship. But how about going back tomorrow or going back to your classroom when you go back to school and creating a definition with your students for digital literacy that supports the needs of your classroom and your learners. And this was something that my friend George Kuros, I love this tweet from him, and he says, the notion of digital citizenship is so messy, all the more reason educators have to be in on these conversations with students. And that says it all. Just like going back to this, like creating a definition, it needs to be something that's transparent and a conversation that's happening all the time. And so to develop a definition together with your kids would make it even more um, relevant to them and they would take ownership. Just like when we make up rules or we make up guidelines for our classroom, these things would help our digital citizenships love what they were um, practicing and what they were developing even more. There's all kinds of ideas, too, that will help you with this. There's things on Common Sense Media. Um, both of these images are linked that you can go to them and either make up a pledge or make up an infographic and even something like this Wordle for your classroom. What are the words that mean a lot to your class as digital citizenship um, and digital literacy when we're looking at these things? And so something like a Wordle would be a great thing to post in your class so you all know what you guys are focusing on. So as I think about how we would define and embrace digital literacy in our classrooms, let's talk about what a digital citizen looks like. So I have this fun video. I'm going to share just a tiny bit of it. Hi, this is Bridger. Say hi, Bridger. Hey, <laughs> Bridger. He is playing with Pat Pat, and he just turned two. So why don't you show us? First of all, show us, draw us a picture. Nope. Yeah, draw us a picture, Bridger. Yeah, I swore. No, draw us a picture first. Okay. Sweet. I'm this excited. Oh. This? Yeah. A red brown one? Do a new one. Okay. A red brown one? Yeah. Why don't you draw a squiggly line? You're so smart, Bridger. Draw us something. Oh, okay. oh, you want to change the background to blue? Yeah, it's blue. Why don't you show us the stamp, like the car stamp or motorcycle stamp? Okay. You you want a dolphin? Okay. You want to find a dolphin? Yeah. Okay. You think there is one in there? Yeah. Hopefully. Ooh, there's some other animals. Why don't you pick another animal? Dinosaur. Ooh, yeah, do the dinosaur. So that's pretty amazing to think about the two-year-old. And, and we've all been there, either had our own kids or seen um, children or family members. And I love it when you go to, like, the mall or you're somewhere and you see kids that are even younger than him navigating devices. And that's the world that our kids live in. Those are digital um, citizens. And when we look at citizenship in the digital age, I love this little infographic from ISTE. And it says on one side what a good citizen is, and then on the other side it has great statistics about good digital citizens. And this is a really good thing when you start cheering to 
when parents have questions or when other teachers or when your kids have questions to go to and look at some of these things on how our kids are actually um, how they're navigating information and how they're living in this digital world and I really like this because it does show the difference and how our kids change all the time on information and not just our kids but us too um, just as people as well Another one that ISTE has is they took the standards last year when they came out in 2016 and they made this poster that says, I am a digital age learner. And you can get this for free online too, just on the ISTE website. And it's great because it talks about digital citizenship, but it also talks about being an empowered learner and a global connector and a creative collaborator. Um, uh, all these things that our kids are doing that really fit into that definition of digital literacy. And so these skills are not just encompassing that digital citizenship piece, but all the things that have to do with literacy and when we add digital to it, ties into being a digital age learner. Being elementary teachers, there's lots of information on the Common Sense website that are perfect for your classroom and perfect to post and perfect to also even have conversations and send home with your kids. I love this little one that they have and all the information on Common Sense is free and so this is just one of their little posters that talks about being a digital citizen. And then this is another really great, the Speak Up 2015 um, research project findings and you can get this on the Project Tomorrow website. And these are 10 things that our K-12 students, that their digital learning should encompass and that they also um, love because their students speaking up. And so, Things like wanting more coding and being able to use Twitter and how our kids watch your videos online. That's like a craze that we're going through at our house with our almost 12 year old, the watching um, YouTube videos and they can watch anything now and learn about anything they want to. But these are all things and this is the voice of our kids and so a really important um, graphic to, to, to know about. Now I had something happen in my family a couple weeks ago and this was about the beginning of when I was really started to think too about these two presentations that I just um, have put together about our digital citizens and, and their digital literacy and it's a story about my niece Gracie and Gracie is 11 and she lives in Iowa too obviously with the pigs and these are her 4-H pigs and Gracie is in fifth grade um, she uses Instagram, she uses Snapchat, and so when she got her pigs, when they were getting ready for the pigs, she took pictures and she documented this whole story. And this was all by herself, no prompting from parents or teachers, just her telling the story. And when she got the pigs, she um, put it on her Instagram and she got all these comments. Then she had her dad, and my brother is a farmer in Iowa, she had her dad use his Twitter to also share it because she wanted the 4-H Twitter account to be able to see her story. And so I started tweeting about it too because I loved the things that she was also using her phone to text me. And so she would say things like, we're writing personal narratives and I wrote mine about pigs. And you could just tell how excited she was, but it was so like intuitive um, to me to look at this and to think about how she was using literacy different, how she was um, tying in all these things that were digital into the story she was telling. The best thing though that happened that really got me thinking is one night I was out to dinner and I came out of the restaurant and I had 172 text messages and I thought something horrible had happened and I didn't hear my phone and I looked and it was from Gracie and she had started this big huge group because she wanted help naming her pigs. So she crowdsourced this through just a, um, a text that she started with her family members and her friends. She even put in research. So she said, you can go to this article in Southern Living and read about favorite pig names. And then she collected all these names into a Google Doc so she could name these pigs that she had. Well, then the next day, she took it even one step further. 
and she used a tool, and I'm going to tell you um, about this in a little bit, called Bunsy, to make a digital story. And she's used this with me before, so she asked me how to log in, and she wrote all about these pigs because she wanted this to be an online journal. And so within like three days, this child, 10-year-old, she took all this stuff and all these stories and put it into this great digital story to be able to not only find and consume information, create digital content, but the big thing for her was being able to communicate and share it with her friends, with her teachers, with her family, and to keep track of it herself. And so when we look at this again, we think about how this fits into these three buckets of digital literacy. Now think too about the stories that you have to fit into these three buckets of digital literacy. When is a time with your classroom and your kids that you found and consumed digital content, they used it to create digital content, and then they communicated and shared it? So I just want to take a couple minutes for you to think about this, and maybe a few people could share um, some examples that you have. So if you'd like to share your example, all you need to do is raise your hand icon and we will unmute you and you can share your, your comment or you can type it in the chat window and we will read it on air. And I know everybody has some cool story of, of their digital citizens, so it's really fun to think about it. Do we have yep. any answers yet? Kay, Kay, I see your hand raised. I am uh, coming over and unmuting you. Kay, you have the microphone. I don't know if this would count, but when um, Notre Dame had their uh, teacher bus going around the country, we set up a Twitter account for the library, and our students were tweeting with the um, Oh gosh, just like that, I forgot what bus it was. Um, when uh, they would go and visit the schools and our, t our first graders were tweeting and talking to the bus as they, they went around the country talking to uh, visiting schools throughout the country from Notre Dame. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Definitely fits into those buckets. <laughs> awesome, Kay, thanks for sharing. You're welcome. Anybody else have a story? Shan, I know there are a lot of great stories on here um, with the people that we have on. I'm, a, I'm hesitant to call anybody out, but folks, I know that we have some some great sh stories. It's um, you know, with what you're doing with your kids in the class, don't hesitate to be able to to raise your hand to share um, any of the stories of the great things that you're doing. When you guys can always share two at the end. If you have one and you want to share it at the end, you want to think about it a little bit, that's cool too. So you keep thinking about it and we're going to go on because this will probably give you even more ideas, the stories that I'm going to share. So with digital literacy and digital citizenship being key skills for living and working in a connected world, how are they embedded into our standards and goals? And this is one thing that we always have to be thinking of is how it ties back into what we're doing in our classrooms. The One of the biggest things for me is looking at the ISTE standards. And we were lucky enough last year to have them come out, the new student standards. And in just a couple of months, the teacher standards will also, um, they've been revisited and revised and they come out at the annual conference. And when we look at this, all of these standards tie into the qualities and the skills that we want our students to be able to have and engage with and thrive in the connected digital world. And so when we look at this, these are the things that we see within these standards, but it also fits into being digital citizens, being empowered learners and a digital citizen, um, the knowledge constructors, innovative designers, 
um, thinkers, creative communicators, um, global collaborators, and all of these things tie into the ISTE standards, but they also run into the AASL standards. And even though your classroom teachers and maybe you um, don't see yourself as even a technology teacher or of course as a librarian, the ISTE standards and the AASL standards are really what drive um, this point in our thinking and within our curriculum. And it's great because these organizations have put these together for all of us, no matter what we teach, no matter how we support kids, to be able to really embed into our classrooms and into our schools. And so we saw the ISTE standards and the things that they encompass. And it's just like that with the 21st Century Learner Standards um, from AASL, and that's the American Association of School Libraries. And these also have been revisited and revised, and they come out in the fall at the biannual conference and so I'm excited to see these because they're also going to be talking about all these things within digital literacy the responsibilities of our kids the skills that we want them to have the ethical behavior um, of information that we want them to be taught using social networks um, using the different technologies and so you can see that these are really tied into the ISTE standards and across the board um, agrees with the things that our kids need to be taught and that we need to be supporting in our classrooms. Now when I started teaching these things and when we started, I'm going to tell you this story too about my meter in a few minutes, but when we really started to go one-to-one -one and infuse a lot of technology and just change the way we were doing things at our school, there was not a curriculum. We had to come up with it ourselves and it was tough. It took us over a year to do that by combining the ISTE standards and AASL and the Common Core. Well, what Common Sense has done, and this is all free online, is they have taken it and they have developed a curriculum that ties into not just the AASL standards, and the ISTE standards, but also to the Common Core. So you can go on this, you can find the grade level that you teach, click on it, and it comes up with these great charts of every standard that our kids need to be learning. This one's for kindergarten. And then in the columns, in the shades of yellow, those are the different activities on where these standards hit. Isn't that amazing? And so it's all lined out for us, all you have to do honestly to really ensure that your kids have a great digital literacy and citizenship um, education within your classroom and within your libraries and other places in your building is follow these and follow through with these activities. And I wish they would have had this when we were doing this because it was tough. And I did learn a lot and it was a great curriculum, but looking at something like common sense and now the things that people are doing, it makes so much more sense and it's so, it's so powerful to see the things that are coming out um, because people are taking the common sense media and then developing developing it for themselves into their district. This is a great example of that. Um, at Long Beach Unified School District, they took that and they took then the different standards, the AASL and ISTE and the Common Core, and they developed then their own rubrics for their kids. And this is a lot like what we did at Van Meter, but it's great because it even ties into those activities that Common Sense has online for free. And so all those digital literacy categories tying into those skills and the different um, competencies that we want our kids to hit and then the activities, it's really come full circle on being able to just supply our kids and our classrooms and our libraries and other places in our buildings with this great rich curriculum. And so you can take a look at that too. Um, there's links in here to all of that information. So we can take these standards and we can embed them into our classrooms and community to really support digital literacy and our digital citizenship within our students' lives. And this is important, you know, not just for our kids at school, but it's also important to us and it's important also to our parents. And so when we look at this, these are just kind of three big things to think about um, when you're thinking about embedding all these things. Um, it's so important to learn the skills yourself. When we started out at Van Meter, that was the number one thing that we did because we realized that our teachers, if they graduated even a year out of college or five years or 20 years like a lot of them, 
they had no idea what these skills were and what they meant and so we went and we made sure that we knew the skills first um, we have to teach the kids to the skills to students by just creating a culture for your digital citizens it has to be in every lesson and every project it's always a teachable moment and when we start looking for these things and just like Gracie's story it makes more sense and they come to surface because we live in a digital world and then we also the last thing is just educating others and we'll talk more about this too but just being able to give support to other teachers and administrators and parents and students in our community and district is also part of the I think goal that we have by embedding all of these skills but really making our community one that is safe and productive for our digital citizens too. So I want to start just by also telling my story before I go into like specific examples of how you can embed this into your classroom. And when we started out at the Meter, uh, and this is probably now I would say 10 years ago, um, I was hired. I was a stay-at-home mom. Um, like I said, I have a teaching degree and an art degree. I did not have any library science training. And they hired me because I was involved in the technology um, committee and I really wanted to change the way that we were doing things at Van Meter. And so when I was hired about a year and a half into my job, um, is when we started down that road of thinking differently and wanting to do things different at our school. And so we didn't just get together as an administrative team, we got together as a community. And we started educating ourselves and our kids on all the things and what it meant to really understand digital learning and um, digital literacy. And so we had things like parent workshops and we had different organizations meet with our kids and with our teachers and we all dug into these things that we didn't even know what the terms meant like what did a wiki mean what did it mean to a web 2.0 tool um, all these things we were learning together because we wanted to make sure that we were ready for what was coming with our one-to-one -one program what was coming with the things that we were doing different another thing that was at the top of our list was making sure that our kids knew what we were doing and so giving them different places our library it had a place online and all of our classrooms had a place online and our resources were there so our kids could get to them easily and we wanted to make sure that they could access them anywhere that they were and we had to make sure these things were in place before we went down this road of really changing up those things that we were doing with our kids. Another thing that we did, and when you think about, um, and this is part of just being a digital citizen and being um, using all those skills of digital literacy, is being able to curate things, being able to bring together all these lists of resources that we've always had, if it's on a sticky note or on a piece of paper that we give to our students, and putting them online, putting them together in a place that made sense to us and it made sense to them, um, Symbaloo became our homepage for everything at our school. And so if you've never seen Symbaloo before, this is a social bookmarking site. And every one of our classrooms had one. And then we had a main one for our library. And so when you look at this and you see these tiles, like the brown tile has a K on it, that was the kindergarten um, symbol. And next to it was the first grade. And all of their resources were on here and organized in this way. It was great for us, like I said, great for us to be organized, but really great for our kids because they were learning those curation skills and they had access to those things when they needed them. Now, this is what our curriculum looked like. And like I said, we spent over a year on this. It was myself and the curriculum director and a handful of teachers and kids. And we looked at the ISTE and AASL standards and the Common Core, and we developed this curriculum um, for our school. And it was something that um, was definitely a labor of love because we not only developed that curriculum, but we started collaborating more and integrating technology into everything we were doing. And our kids were a huge part of this and played 
a big part in that collaboration. And they even had, this is our elementary kids, this actually, Bill, is Sean Heyer's um, daughter, Eve, and we started the Technical Difficulties Library Club. And they were even helpers in making sure that our teachers knew the skills that they needed to be teaching to their kids. And so it was great because together we created a positive and empowering culture for our students and our community within our digital world. Now, we taught these skills to our digital citizenship, why, citizens, why we were looking at these things, why we were creating a culture for our digital citizens, why we were embedding digital literacy and digital citizenship through everything we did. And remember, like I said, every lesson, every project was a teachable moment. And so back to those things again, those three things that you can be doing and thinking about all the time, and that's how we really started to change the way we were doing things. And again, when we look at these stories and we look at all these examples, think about how they fit in to these three buckets. So I want you to keep these in your mind, and I'm going to tell you a couple stories. And this will help you really realize, I think, too, as elementary teachers, how things that you're already doing are fitting into all of these buckets. Um, this is one for an Iowa animal project that our kids did in kindergarten. And when we started this project, one little boy named Gunner was one that I was really focusing on because of the things and the trouble that he was having um, with what we were doing with this project. And Gunner came to me one day when we were getting ready to Skype Seymour Simon into our kindergarten room so Seymour could talk to the kids about essential questions. And Gunner did not want to share his project. He was not excited about it. And when he got up to the computer, I learned why. And Seymour could tell, too, that Gunner was out of sorts and he wasn't happy to be there. And he asked him what was wrong. And Gunner said, well, I have an Iowa snake and I don't want an Iowa snake. I want to research a woolly mammoth. And so Seymour said, well, why can't you? And he said, well, my teacher won't let me. And so we're both like, well, just let Gunner do it because he was passionate about it. He had already obviously done research about it. He probably had 20 books about a woolly mammoth at his house. And he was excited about researching the woolly mammoth and was not thrilled about doing the Iowa snake. And so his teacher agreed to let him do that. And what we saw over the next couple weeks was we saw Gunner turn into the student that we had never seen before. We saw him using PebbleGo to research. We saw him excited about sharing during our project parade in the library with our parents. He not only did one project, but he did three projects to share when they only had to do one about the woolly mammoth. And he was so proud that day to stand up on all the research and things he had created and the connections he had made to say that he Prove that the woolly mammoth did not walk across Iowa, but he went on to say all the things that the woolly mammoth could do and all the characteristics and traits of them. And it was so fun to see not only him, but all of the kids just so um, tuned into what they had learned in this project because we let them really guide their own learning and have a voice in what they were doing as digital citizens. And when we we wrapped it up by Skyping with Seymour again, and it was so fun to see. And you can tell here these projects were amazing. To see these kids and what they had done at five and six years old and totally becoming these digital citizens that we had never seen before was empowering not just to them, but to us too as teachers. And this project, and I, I hope you're thinking about the buckets too and how these things fit into these buckets, but this project is even, um, it's made closer to me because it has to do with Hagen. And Hagen is my youngest one, and he's now in sixth grade, but he was in third grade. He came home and he said, Mom, they're going to ban the rainbow loom bracelets. And I said, why? What's going on? And I was so disappointed because we had just got a loom, and he was so excited, and the kids were excited at school. And Hagen said, well, we're like, they're really becoming distracting, and we're throwing them, and we're trading them in class. And I was like, well, they're going to get taken away because you're not using them appropriately. And so I said, you guys are going to have to think of what you're going to do or change the way that you're you do things. And so the next day they came to me in the library, him and a group of his friends, 
and they said we want to do a project and that year we wanted them to figure out their own PBL project, their own project based learning project and they said this would be a great one for our PBL project and we want to call it banding together and they went on to say that they wanted to get into groups and they wanted to research and they wanted to prove all these things about like math and entrepreneurship and where Rainbow Loom came from and the money the company had made but the real reason is because they wanted to also prove that they were responsible citizens in their classroom and that they didn't need those bracelets taken away and so we watched these kids become just so enthralled by um, looking at the model inquiry and Skyping with people and communicating and um, sharing and creating and it was so great on this day they wanted to learn more about citations and so I reached out to my friends at EasyBib and they Skyped in and not only taught the kids about citations but EasyBib also got in on the project and started creating bracelets um, in their office too in New York to send to the kids and I started to talk about it a lot on Twitter and my blog and Rainbow Loom picked up the project and they started talking about it and the kids in the school not just in Higgins class started bringing in all these bracelets to the library well people were watching and people saw what we were doing in our library and so this man his name is Mark and he was a superintendent in Wisconsin um, he was actually the first school that we ever connected with on Skype um, uh, probably 10 years ago and he's now a missionary in Africa and Mark said Shannon I would be great if you could send those bracelets to Africa to my kids and so think about those buckets think about all the things that the kids were doing and I was like oh this is perfect that's like the connection piece that's that global voice that our kids can have well then a organization in New York in this together media reached out to my kids and they're a publishing group and they had a aunt in India who worked at an orphanage and they said we would love to have the bracelets also sent here so the kids now were creating bracelets they had a mission on why and they had this global footprint this global voice in this project too so they sent the um, bracelets and we were talking about all these things and we were of course writing about it and tweeting about it and having a voice from our library and pretty soon in this together media a couple weeks later they reached out and they said we would love to start an organization with your kids and so they started banding together and they started a Facebook page and a Tumblr and they started even thinking even more in depth about these bracelets how they could tie in math with a 3d printer and create their own charms and we Skyped with a poet um, Joyce Sidman and they created love poems that she helped them make a template to put on their bracelets and when they sent these bracelets off think of all of those literacy skills that they were tying into these bracelets and this project that Hagen really came home and started just because they were passionate about wanting to keep these bracelets in their classroom and in their school and so we were still talking about it of course and can you guys guess what happened next? If people were watching all over the world, they started to create bracelets too. And so all of a sudden, thousands and millions and probably billions of bracelets started coming to Van Meter, Iowa from people all over the world wanting to do the same thing with their kids. And so when we sent these bracelets off to India and to Africa, that's when it really became full circle because the kids got these great letters back because of course the kids there didn't have technology but they got these beautiful letters and we were expecting even me was expecting them not to be like this they were just kids you know they were just kids that colored with markers and talked about their family and their pets and these kids had nothing but they had these kids in Iowa and all over the world being champions for them and their learning and just who they were as people and so this project continues and I love to talk about this because it's a great one to um, for elementary kids it's a great one for digital literacy skills and you can now go and be a noble kid because the project got so big that I couldn't do it by myself anymore and so the kids partnered with them a couple years ago and you can go on here and see how you can get involved it's not just about bracelets it's about connecting their voice and all these digital skills 
um, to something like this, to a big global project. And you can check out their Facebook too. And one thing cool that Hagen and his friends are still doing is for the last two years, my husband, he works for Capstone Publishing and Capstone sponsors a school in Mexico. And so we have brought bracelets the last couple of years so the kids can make their bracelets to there and so it's another really cool thing to be able to get involved in um, with your kids too and so if you're interested either go to the website or tell me afterwards or um, email me or something because this is a perfect project for like I said your elementary kids and really tying in all of those digital literacy skills and like we see and we look at these buckets and we hear these stories now because we're so lucky to have things like Twitter and blogs and um, conferences that we can go to to see these great projects of tying in digital literacy skills in just a meaningful way and it makes a difference um, for these kids in the world and it makes a difference too in their lives and so when we look at these and we think about like these stories and the curriculum that we have and all the things that we did at our school everything we did tied back into what we were doing so if we Skyped that was a skill that our kindergartners had to be successful at. If we were using a database like Pebble Go, those were skills that we wanted them to be able to read um, online and we wanted them to be able to create with the content that they were reading to. We use tools, I'm going to tell you about this in a few minutes, we use tools like Flipgrid um, for them to just have a global voice and to be able to talk about the information that they were reading about in different places. And also to be able to use this information and one of the buckets is to be able to create their own information from what they were reading and so all of that content where if they're getting it from an ebook or a database or if they're getting it from a website or maybe even from each other or an expert whoever it might be and to be able to take that and to create new content from what they're reading that is a skill and we're so lucky to have all these great tools to be able to do that and all of these projects too are linked in these slides and so you'll be able to get to them but you can see that even using things like this, this is the tool called called um, Flip Snack and using this the kids even said how they can be safe online and you know drawing their pictures and uploading them to make this great ebook but think about all the skills that they were practicing and that they were being successful at by doing something like this this is kind of a cool project and if you haven't spent any time yet in your classroom this year just on like digital citizenship and talking about being safe online um, Chromeville is an augmented reality app and website and it's really cool because it is a free tool and I love this because you can go online you can print out this coloring sheet then kids can it asks on the bottom what it means to be a good digital citizen they can draw a picture use the app and scan that and you can see that when they scan it the augmented reality, the little person right there named Zoe, she comes to life. And when they click on the clicker, if you've never used augmented reality before, it's kind of hard to explain um, without seeing it, but there's a link to the blog post in here. When they click on that clicker, when this little Zoe does, it even walks them through on the screen different prompts on what it means to be a good digital citizen. So perfect activity. Um, you can do this in like 30 minutes with your kids, but it really talks about just simple skills on how to be safe online. Um, this is a good one also for digital um, literacy. Um, taking something like this little boy wanted to make an I Spy book. And so they brought all the materials to class. They took real pictures with their iPads, real photographs. They put them together into a book. Not only put it together though in a book just to share with their um, classroom, we reached out to Jean, who is the author of the I Spy books, and they Skyped with her to share this great book that they created. And then we took it one step further, and we took that book that they created, and we cataloged it in our library. And so we started doing that with our projects by, you know, one of the things, one of those buckets and those skills that we want our kids to have is to be creators and to be able to publish and share things. And so not only sharing it within our school or sharing it with others, but keeping it in a collection and keeping it somewhere that other people can look at it too. Um, also helping kids, you know, this goes back to like that curation I was talking about with the Symbaloo. Helping kids too and parents get the things that they need on their own devices. 
or that they need at home as well. That's something that's important too because we have to give our kids access to these tools and these different resources if we expect them to be the digital citizens that we want them to be and so that's a really important thing to do too. Um, also this is just another project and one thing that I really like to do too is infographics are so popular right now and either creating videos or infographics and and just talking to the kids again about what it means to be a good digital citizen this really ties into making that definition as a class and making it um, with them and so these are two great projects to do that too. Now this is one of my favorite projects right now and this could be tied in, it, didn't, it wouldn't have to be a digital citizenship survival kit, it could also be a digital literacy survival kit, but this is a great post and I saw this recently at a conference um, too, we actually did an activity, but by creating this with your kids they can really have their hands because these are kind of abstract concepts to us but also to our kids and so when they can actually feel these things and, and make something, so using something Oh, we see in here like a magnifying glass and we can say remember your first impression started with a handshake now they start with Google people are using Google to find out information about us what will show up when someone searches you on Google and all of these things then tie back into being digital citizens or using our digital literacy skills and so there's links in here to these as well but that's one of my new kind of favorite things um, I think for kids and just a great place to to start out with a conversation about digital literacy and citizenship also using social media that's a huge part and as elementary teachers of course we're not having our kids sign up for Twitter, or Facebook, or things like that, but it needs to be a conversation because the reality is, is that's where our kids are at. And so I always use these type of things as teachable moments because I wanted my kids to be safe. And I wanted my parents also to know how to keep them safe. And so we had these conversations with our parents too. But by using Twitter, like in our elementary classrooms in our library, we would share things if it was work and things that we were celebrating and things that we were doing with our kids. Um, Instagram to have the kids be able to post pictures um, themselves. This is actually Eve Hire, Eve Hire again, um, a teacher that Bill and I both know and she was, a, she was great even when she was a little person. She was in second grade then and she hopped up on this table and took a picture on our Instagram but on this page, all she had to do was, even though she was taking that on our library Instagram and posting it, I taught them to how to make little comments. And this was hers, my friends making dots. Today we are second. And that's pretty powerful for a second grader to be able to share that. But it's also this great teachable moment because, like I said, this is where our kids are at. Also using things like online, not just reading tools for the kids to read, but online communities for them to talk about their reading. Um, Biblionasium is a free site. It's amazing because kids can not only make bookshelves of what they're reading, but it's such a safe place to go. And I love how they have this honor code for our kids to be able to um, take it and be able to be kind and safe and honest when they're talking about books and when they're reviewing them and sharing them with their friends. And so this is a great place, um, especially with summer reading coming up that we can share with our kids, but that we can get them talking about the books they're reading and really reflecting on that reading too. Now there's lots of places to go for lesson and project ideas. Um, one thing that I did was I put together this digital literacy padlet and this is just crowdsourced from people all over the world. I shared it on um, Twitter and I shared it on my Facebook and these are ideas from lots of different people on how they're using um, digital literacy projects and how they're tying it into the projects they're doing. Also going back to Common Sense Media, the scope and sequence that's out there is just really great because there's so many lessons for all of our grade levels on whatever we're teaching, whatever topic it is. And so being safe, um, documenting their creative work. I love this one. I actually printed this off today and it gives them even this little rubric of how to um, not just see like using, you know, safe images from different places or images that would have that Creative Commons mark on it, but also giving credit to their creative work too. 
Um, this is a great one, and a couple of you had this, I think, on your survey in the beginning, your pre-conference or um, pre-workshop survey that you had. But this is one about rating websites, and they also have a great rubric on being able to look like if the author can be trusted and if this information um, has what you need and is it up to date and really working through this is the teacher view but when you print it off as the student view it's great because it's really easy for them. There's also lots of games and videos and these things are all free online. Um, I don't know if you guys have done Breakout EDU but yet but it's great because you use a box or some kind of container and a set of locks and then you give your um, kids, it's a puzzle that they are solving this series of challenging puzzles that will open up then this box or this container. And when you look on the website, there are a lot that tie into digital citizenship and literacy. This is one on passwords. And you can go here and get this for free. You can also create your own too. And then Common Sense has one called Digital Passport, and this is really good for our kids in third through fifth grade, um, working with some of those digital safety skills and respect and community um, that we want our kids to all hit, and so that's a good one, and they love it because they can get badges for it too. Um, PBS Go also has Webinots, which is the little internet academy that they have, which is really fun. And then the Infinite Learning Lab, or it used to be called Professor Garfield, they have these great videos and little things that the kids work through. They're kind of like tutorials. And my kids love these. I use these a lot with my elementary kids. And one of them that I love is like forms of media, um, online safety, and so you can go there and check out those too. Vocabulary also has several videos that are free on their website, and they have an elementary version now, and so some of these are really great too. Um, really quick little wraps to be able to teach your kids these fun skills that they need to know. Now I wanted to just talk briefly about fake news because that was another thing that people had questions about. And with fake news, that's another thing in media literacy that is kind of a foreign concept to us and hard for us to wrap our heads around. But the Media Literacy Project, they defined it as the ability to access, analyze, evaluate, and create media. And when we look at this, one of the best sites, once again, is to go to Common Sense Media. They have a brand new place in the site that is so great for our elementary kids. And I'm not going to play this right now, but I wanted to put this in there for you because you watch this for like a minute and a half, and I did this a few weeks ago, and I really understood it different how my kids, even the youngest ones, can be those fact checker checkers and that they can understand fake news and um, media literacy. And then they have a site that you can go to to not only pull off information, but you can also get those same posters that they have with digital literacy and even great projects too that tie into our grades K through five and beyond too, but this is relevant for tonight. And these are really great because they tie into all these different topics that are great for even our youngest learners. And so I love what they have put together. And I know you will too because they've done a really great job just like they do on everything. But this really made sense to me because this is a hot topic right now and so many things going on about it just in the world that we live in and within education. And so you can go there and check that out, but also check out this Padlet of different research and different um, project ideas too that people are adding. Also on the Common Sense site, they have a place way at the bottom, just articles. And this is helpful too because, like I said, that's a big topic, um, even just for us as adults and uh, what we're dealing with too with this, um, all of this fake news phenomenon, like they said, and so you can go there too. Now we also have to educate and support our families. And so one thing that I did, and I said this before, is making sure that our teachers were really communicative with our families about that curriculum and the things that we were teaching them. We had different workshops after school for our teachers, and we would invite our parents too. And so inviting them to learn about, you know, passwords on how their kids were being safe and digital citizenship and all these things in media and using resources like what they have on PBS Parents and Common Sense 
and the P21 has partnered with the PTA to really bring together a great suite of tools for all of us to use and these are all free to online. Um, this is a really cool one on Common Sense Education. They have this family dinner project. I love this because it's talking about how to have an event and it's called a community dinner and you don't even have to have any food but you all come together and it's basically about like talking to your kids and putting your devices down and having these conversations and how you have conversations too just about how much time they're using technology and really looking at what it means to be safe online as a family so that's a good piece. Now I have a couple pieces left of this and I didn't think I would get to the last part, but I want to go over these, um, just these tools, and then I'm going to show you some actual digital tools, but probably skip kind of over those, and you guys can always go back to those, um, but I wanted to put them in there for reference, but I didn't want to miss these digital um, books because I took a look at your website today and all of the great links that you have on here to be able to use, but I wanted to tell you about a few more as well. Um, this is a set of books that I actually did with Cantata Learning, and Cantata Learning, you guys would all love it because there are these great picture books and they have music that go with them. So any topic you can think of from social studies to science to um, social emotional skills, um, we now have these library skills. And so being able to like stay safe online when you go to this book, it's also this sweet little song and I wrote it and Emily Arrow, if you guys haven't seen her yet, you have to check her out too, is the one who sings them and so you can go to this and I put a link in the book cover, you can even go to this um, free online the song to be able to find that one and then all these other books that tie into the skills and so when it's even talking about finding a book it's even tying in the digital um, ebooks manners in the library it's talking about technology and fiction and nonfiction tying into some digital literacy skills Capstone also has a lot of, I just came back from a big library conference and there's lots and lots of books out right now um, about these topics, especially media literacy and fake news. It seems like is really bubbling to the top, but these are just kind of an example of some of them that you'll be able to find. And Learner also has, I love this one, it's a set of coding books, but not just coding, it's also um, being safe online and using your digital literacy skills and all these things um, about digital identity and so a really great place to go. And I've talked about Pebble Go a lot. I know a couple of your schools also have Pebble Go, but I wanted you guys to be able to also just use it and see it for a couple um, weeks because I've talked about it a lot tonight. And so I got a trial and you can log into this for um, another month, a little longer than a month, about five weeks to be able to check it out too and use it with your kids. But I love a lot of these different resources that we have and you guys have some great databases too. And so don't forget to look at some of those resources. Um, when you go on here, you can, Pebble Go is a database that has five different um, kind of categories and like animals for example, it has great teacher resources that you can go and you can, you know, some, if you don't want to teach these skills in isolation because we have so many things in our classrooms to teach, you can go here and you can find some of these things like these little fortune tellers to be able to tie in some of these skills that we want our kids with research. Every article has a citation attached. So that's an important thing for us to be able to teach our kids about citations. Well, you don't have to do that now with ebooks and databases. Most of them have citations that go with them. And they have these great sheets that you can print off for our kids to be able to really tie in those writing skills, um, even on paper from what they're learning in a digital sense. Um, Pebble Go also has Go Next, which ties in kind of for our older kids, and that password works for that too. This is a free one, and I wanted to mention this. This is DK Find Out. 
um, DK Find Out is a free database with tons and tons of information and a lot of the same type of stuff that PebbleGo has. And so when you go here, your kids can take quizzes. You can go to the teacher resources and find things. Um, it again ties into those research skills and digital literacy skills and of course media literacy because like I looked at this today um, I was helping my son with a project and on the front page was National Poetry Month and so they keep it up to date just like they do Pebble Go. Now if you haven't seen Epic I had to throw this in there too. Um, Epic is over 20,000 free ebooks and as teachers we can sign up for this as free. Our kids can even bring home the code that they use at school and use it at home for free too. But it's an important skill for our kids to be able to read books online and like I said this all ties in to being digital citizens as we know and so being a librarian these things are are really important to me but I know as classroom teachers these are resources that are also so invaluable um, for you too. Now I want to just go to a couple um, digital tools and apps and I'm not going to spend any time on them I'm going to kind of whip through these so we can get to the end but I wanted to put these in here and just some slides on using Skype in the classroom and using the different resources that they have and when you think about Skype and maybe you don't think about before this as that being kind of a skill with digital citizens and digital literacy well like we heard from our friend earlier that shared the story about tweeting when the Notre Dame bus came through. Um, you know, that's skill, using Twitter, um, using Skype, having our kids learn how to be connected. And there's so many great things on that website. And I put this calendar in here too because the thing that's great about Skype, especially I think as elementary teachers, is there's activities all year long that we can take part in. And this is just a Google Doc that I started last year that has things all throughout the year that you can get in on two and tomorrow is Pullman Our Pocket Day and if you've never celebrated this before it's such a fun day and I put together this Skype with all of these people and some special guests too like Mrs. P and Emily Arrow and teachers and you can also have your kids you can join it's at 1030 um, central time tomorrow and it's a Google Hangout and so think of all of the skills that we talked about tonight when we're doing something like this that tie into an activity like this and so please take advantage of it and it will also be taped so you can go back and watch it too. Now the next ones I'm just going to kind of flip through um, using Buncee is a great digital tool. I wish I had time to talk about all of these but of course I talked too much about all the other great things. Um, great digital storytelling tool and I talked about that a lot tonight but this is one of my favorite ones when kids are creating their digital stories to be able to use if you've never seen Buncee before this is a Padlet that just gives you lots of ideas. Um, Storybird is another digital storytelling tool. This one is driven by not the things that kids create like in Buncee, but it's driven by the illustrations that are already there for them to be able to create picture books and chapter books and um, poetry as well. But this is a really cool one because um, it's all free and there is a free version too of Buncee. But it's really great because you can not only make digital stories, but they can also print their stories out. And this is one my daughter did, um, and it was a hardback, but you can even print it out just on paper. And then mentioning Padlet, that's one that we used, and it's great for collaboration, great for digital literacy, um, great too just for those digital citizenship skills of them being able to you know, write with a class and be able to communicate together. And in these pages, when I show a project like this, you'll be able to click on these two and kind of see some of these projects. And the last one I want to end with is Flipgrid. And I don't know if you guys have seen Flipgrid, but Flipgrid is so great. And they just came out with a free version. And so Flipgrid 1 lets you sign up for Flipgrid for free. And with Flipgrid, what you do is you create, this is a Flipgrid and you collect your student responses on this Flipgrid from videos. And so I created one, and I want you to do this when we're all done with this tonight, and we'll watch for your little videos to come up. But you go to this Flipgrid, you can either scan it, or you can go to this URL, you click on Add a Response, and you can see at the top I asked, 
How will you embed digital literacy into your classroom? Well, if you did this for your kids, you could ask them anything. You could ask them what the job of the president was. You could ask them what it meant to be a digital citizen. You could ask them, you know, what they were going to do this summer. Anything you want to on here to collect their video responses. The cool thing is, is then as a class, just like when we watched that Padlet, we saw all those responses being populated. Well, kids can then respond either with a video or they can um, type out a response too to their classmates and then you have this great community online but you're practicing all of those cool digital um, literacy skills that we want our kids to have. Now I put together a symbol or two of all of the resources on here because remember I told you I had a lot to share and so you have the website um, that we did tonight, the, the Google Slides, and then you have this symbol that you'll be able to get to all of the resources on here as well. And we know that teaching and supporting our digital citizens is one of the most important things that we must do as educators and parents. So let's get started by empowering our students today. And I really encourage you to look for those teachable moments, just like I did when I was watching what Gracie was doing with her pigs and what I do with Hagen. He's playing his game here, but you can't hear him, but he's actually playing with two sets of cousins in different parts of Iowa. And these type of things happen in our classrooms and happen around us all the time. And so we have all these great teachable moments and great times to have conversations with our kids to be able to teach them these skills. And most of all, we have the chance to really empower our children to be leaders in the digital world by celebrating being kind and intelligent and creative citizens and friends. And so I hope I gave you lots of great um, information tonight and lots of good ideas to be able to use these with your kids too. And all of these projects I also talk about on my blog and I blog a lot. It's kind of my outlet for sharing things. And please feel free to reach out to me anytime. My email is here and I tweet at Shannon M. Miller and I am happy to help you in any way. So that was a lot. Thank you guys for having me. Um, and if you guys have questions, I can answer them now. Oh, well, Shannon, thank you so much. Um, not only for all the resources, but, um, you know, setting up the, the, the Pebble Go uh, trial that was awesome and um, the the Flipgrid um, certainly I encourage everybody you know a part of part of the digital citizenship and digital literacy pieces as Shannon mentioned being able to model it um, you know so certainly uh, I hope we will all take the opportunity whether it be tonight or tomorrow um, just to be able to participate in that Flipgrid. Um, so Shannon, thank you. And as Shannon mentioned, if anybody has any questions or any comments, um, you know, that you would like to be able to either ask now or bring up now, uh, feel free um, to raise your hand and uh, I'll come over and, and give you the microphone um, as we're waiting to see if there are any questions. Just as a reminder, you know, this whole presentation, uh, the link was shared out in the, uh, in the chat window. Um, the link to the presentation will also be shared uh, later tomorrow when you receive a follow-up email from the the webinar platform with all of the resources so you know really take take this presentation um, you know mark it as one of your favorites and um, you know take the opportunity to be able to to go through it at your pace since there are a lot, such a lot of great resources and um, Kay I see that you have your hand raised so I'm going to come over to you and once again give you the microphone so Kay go ahead you have the mic Thanks, Bill. Uh, Shannon, how yeah. long of a school day do you people have to do all of this? <laughs> we, just a normal school day. Now remember, I always like to say this when I talk to groups, is this is a story of, of many years of, of all these stories. And, you know, when I would do projects like this and things like, um, you know, that we were doing, it was something that you know, you take on one thing at a time. And these projects, especially as we got going, like the project, for example, with Hagen's Rainbow Loom Bracelets, it was so great because it lasted, It that project probably lasted for six weeks and it continued and it still continues in things that we do with his teachers at his school. And so, you know, even though you heard it in an hour and a half, just remember that everything you do, you can make it into a teachable moment and, and work it into the things that you're already doing. 
um, you know, as a teacher and, and with collaborating, you know, hopefully with your librarians and other people in your, in your um, schools too. I, I thank you because uh, on Twitter, I used to follow Hagen's blog when he was uh, smaller, when he was younger. And uh, I haven't been on there for a while, and I really should get back to, uh, you know, yeah. reading his blog. I used to enjoy reading his blog at that time, and I would show it to my students in the library and say, "You can do this too," you know. It's so, so fun. Thank yeah. Well, and and please, if you're interested, like reach out and and get involved. The cool thing, and I, I should put this in the presentation, is um, next. February in 2018, I have a job in India, and we're taking Hagen with us, and we're going to the orphanage. And so I have been having um, some people, I need to blog about it and let people know because people are starting to send bracelets again. And now they're not rainbow loom, they're made out of like, remember when we used to make like them out of like cross stitch, um, yeah. like yarn? And so um, I need to blog about that and have Hagen write about it because I told him, I'm like, we have like a year to collect bracelets again to be able to take them. So that will be just so cool to be able to do that with Hags. Thank you so much. Thanks, yeah, Thank you. Thanks, Kay. Uh, any other questions that you have? Uh, Aaron, I'm going to flip it over to you. Any uh, questions that came through uh, the question window as well for Shannon? Yeah, well, we um, had a comment from Joe regarding um, uh, using a, a digital tool in the classroom, and I'll, I'll read you Joe's comment. He said, I teach third grade, and my class did a project on the planets. Uh, they were put into groups and assigned a planet. Each of my students had an iPad and researched together and created their own Google slide presentations and presented them to the class using the smart board. So I thought that was a great great yeah. technique and tool to kind of merge collaboration and digital techniques and, and so it's really exciting. That, that's a great one. Um, and we also we had a lot of um, a lot of questions about Pebble Go and I was just wondering if you could kind of elaborate a little bit about like kind of what Pebble Go is and, and how you've used it. Yeah, are my slides still up? Yes. Yes. Here let me just let me just go back to so Pebble Go, and I, three of your schools have it actually because um, I I did some research. And I can't tell you which ones do, um, but I so Pebble Go is a database, and it's awesome because. I mean, there's lots of things out there, just like DK Find Out. And DK Find Out is great, but it's a lot of content for our little ones. And so with, with Pebble Go, there's six different databases that you can choose from. And you can see that, like, one of them is Animales, so, like, the Spanish version of animals, um, science, biography, social studies, and dinosaurs. And when they go to these databases, then the kids, I'm trying to try, the kids can read about different topics. And as you can see, they're very well organized. They have tabs. They're all set up the same way. It doesn't matter, like, which database you're in. This is from the social studies one. Um, and then they can be read to. So for your little ones, they can click on that little um, like microphone thing and it will read to them. It also highlights the words as it's being read to. Um, there's videos that go with each article. Um, there's citations and then the thing for me that really got all of my teachers on board with not only collaborating with me but collaborating with each other but also seeing all of our kids as like researchers like using something digital were these worksheets and I'm not really a huge worksheet person I loved these because you can go there print them off we use them in our writing stations we use them with the kids with PBL projects and as you can see they loved it I mean from his little face is so sweet but it's also cool because now they've added Pebble Go next and so Pebble Go is probably for like I would say 
um, kindergarten to second, third grade, and then Pebble Go Next is for third grade to like fifth grade, maybe even like third to sixth, just kind of depending. Um, but they have states, science, social studies, and then our American Indians, and then social studies comes out in a month. Um, and so it will cover almost all those. The great thing too though is like the science is all tied to the next gen science standards, every single one of them. The states and the social study is all tied back to the common core and all of the um, standards that we want our kids to hit. And so it's research based, it's all written, you know, by experts. And it's it's awesome. And so we have this in this in the state of Iowa, our state. We're lucky because they provide our databases. Um, the whole state of Iowa has this. We've had it probably for the last five years. Um, but talk about a difference. This made a bigger difference with my kids more than anything that we had when it came to just digital resources that we have, and just lots of content too to be able to. You know, like I said, the teacher resources are amazing um, that they have. And then just by following, like, the Pebble Go hashtag on Twitter and following some of these ideas are just really great, too. So it's awesome. Well, Shannon, again, thanks thanks for, you know, getting that um, that trial through the yeah. end. It was through the end of next month, correct? Yeah, through the end of May. Yep. Okay, great. Excellent. Well, I am. Um, I'm going to take the screen back from you, um, and I just wanted to, um, you know, certainly, Shannon. I, I want to thank you. I want to thank you for your for your time, not only tonight, um, but your time. I know over the past couple of weeks, um, you know, in preparing for this um, and your expertise in, in this area. I know that you are, you know, somebody that a lot of people look towards and um, and lean on. You know, for for resources and for information about this topic, and I am um, I speak on behalf of Alyssa and Aaron and our teachers. We're just so grateful, you know, for your uh, for your time with us um, in preparation and your time with with us this evening. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. And thank you, you know, as well to everyone for joining us tonight. Um, while this is the final webinar for this school year. Uh, that does not mean that the learning ends from AOP Tech. You know, we encourage you always to engage with AOP Tech across uh, all the various social media platforms. Um, certainly, we will continue to post short video utor tutorials and resources on YouTube's, YouTube, YouTube, as well as uh, we continue to encourage you to connect with each other online to share your experiences and resources. Um, there are a lot of great things happening in the Archdiocese K-12 and um, social media is a great place to be able to connect with other educators in the different corners um, of our five county area. And we encourage you as always to use the uh, AOP Tech hashtag um, to always know where to meet each other, where to be able to hold those conversations and to share resources. Uh, and as well, um, along with the feedback for tonight's webinar that I believe Aaron already posted and that you will receive uh, tomorrow night in the follow-up email. In a few weeks, we will be looking for feedback on our webinar series as a whole, both from this year and also in preparation for next year. Uh, we want to make sure that we are meeting your needs um, through these learning opportunities. So everything from um, content to topics to presenters um, to questions about Act 48, um, you know, please provide all of your open and honest feedback. And um, uh, Aaron and Alyssa, I think Alyssa may have stepped away, but certainly appreciate uh, all the time and energy that um, both Aaron and Alyssa have provided for us this year in supporting these webinars and presenting themselves and also in being the hosts. So I certainly wish everyone um, a good and smooth close to the end of the week. Um, if you are in the city of Philadelphia, I wish you all the best getting around with the draft this week happening in town. Uh, but certainly I wish you, your students, and your school community a wonderful um, lead up to the end of the school year. And for those students who are graduating and moving on, certainly wish you and them congratulations and uh, well as we move into the summer. So thank you everyone for a great uh, year and thank you everyone for all of your engagement and interest in our webinar series this year. We'll look forward to connecting with you online uh, through the end of the school year over the summer and look forward to a great 17-18 academic year next year. 
Thanks, everyone. Have a great one.